Have your Bibles this afternoon. Amen. And you would join me in the 10th chapter of the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third gospel account recorded by the Gentile physician Luke. Luke was a doctor in his time. And he followed Jesus and became a full-time disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this text today, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through verse 36, this was written by Luke, the Gentile physician. And he writes, as I read today from the King James text, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, meaning Jesus, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he, meaning Jesus, said unto him, the lawyer, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance, there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him, and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, meaning the next day, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, again meaning the lawyer, Go and do thou likewise. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, we come before you in prayer. As the word of God is about to go forth, we ask for the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon your messenger. Lord, I am as frail and as human full of weakness and fault and sin as any human being on this planet. And yet, you called me to this work. I would not do what I'm doing were it not for the divine call of God that I felt on my life when I was still very young. Lord, today, Jesus, I know that I have nothing to say that could help anybody. But I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost for when the Spirit of God comes down and touches my lips and my mind 
and causes me to speak that which you would have me to speak. Suddenly, Lord, the words which proceed from my mouth hold great value and great importance for those that hear. Master, today let the anointing of God touch me as the speaker. Let it touch every hearer, those who are watching live right now, those who will later, by reason of the internet, hear and see this message. Let the Spirit of God touch their heart and help them to receive this word with gladness that it might bring forth fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake in their lives. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. One of the most important lessons that we must learn concerning the study of God's Word is the need to keep everything in context. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and he wrote these words, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of God requires a few things. It requires, first and foremost, that we keep all passages in context. That's why, uh, even if I'm just trying to use a part of a passage in my message, I will read the passage in context. I will not take it out of context, because to do so, you're doing it a disservice. You need to keep everything in context. Secondly, we need to understand the background relative to the passage that we are reading. And thirdly, we need to understand correctly, and this is very important, this is where cults famously will go off in a different direction in order to achieve their ends. So listen carefully. Understanding correctly what category the passage we are reading falls under. Say, what category? Yes, categories can include such things as, is it prophecy? Is it wisdom? Is it a commandment? Is it a parable? It is folly to try and interpret a passage as the one we have read here today, for instance, as falling into a category in which it does not properly fall. Many cults will use this technique, perverting and misrepresenting a passage and its nature or what category it falls in, in order to create a false narrative. For instance, cults will use a passage that is, in fact, a parable, and Tommy, they'll try to tell you it's prophecy. It's not prophecy, it's a parable. When it talks about the Lord going away and coming to back and finding his servant not doing its job properly and beating his servant and what have you, that is not a prophetic passage, that is a parable passage. And there's a lesson to be learned in that passage. That's what a parable is, a story with a lesson attached to it, okay? But it is not prophecy. And using that passage as a prophecy is what the Jehovah's Witnesses do to try to create this notion that we're the one true religion, we're the one true faith, because Jesus came back invisibly and he found the, the watchtower to be the one servant that was doing properly. Am I telling the truth? But they're using a passage that is not prophetic, has nothing in the universe to do with prophecy, and they're using it as though it's prophetic. Do you follow what I'm saying? So you got to be very careful that you keep things in the right category because it's very easy to be misled if you misinterpret and mishandle the Word of God. It must be rightly divided. The passage we've read today cannot prophesy 
properly be understood either unless we understand exactly what category it falls into and understand the context. What is the context? Well, the context is that a man who was very well trained and very well studied in the law of Moses came to Jesus. Listen, the context is all provided in this passage. He came to Jesus with the intention of tripping him up. His whole purpose in asking this question was to try to trip the Lord up. And he asked him, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? I don't, or eternal life. I don't know exactly why he thought this would trip the Lord up, but he felt it would. And the Lord answered him and said, what is written in the law? Now, why would the Lord say to a lawyer, <laughs> what is written in the law? Well, of course, this man's a student of law. He studies the law of Moses. Therefore, he's saying to this man, well, hey, go back to your authority. Go back to what you know. What does the law say you have to do? And the lawyer quotes what is considered to be the most important commandment in the entirety of the law of Moses, Jesus himself said, this was the first law and the most important law. To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your strength and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. And the Lord said to the lawyer, he said, okay, so do that and you'll live. Well, the lawyer wasn't happy. He didn't get the reaction he was hoping to get. So now he said, aha, I'll trip him up further. I'll ask him. So then, just who qualifies as my neighbor? And the Lord responds to his query with a parable. A story that illustrates a point or that brings a lesson to the table. Now here's the thing that cracks me up. I've spent my whole life in church, and I have heard song after song, and I sing some songs that do this. I've heard song after song and sermon after sermon, and they love to use the parable of what is commonly called today the Good Samaritan. They love to use the parable of the Good Samaritan, and they love to say that the Samaritan represents the Lord. And the Lord finds us broken, and the Lord finds us hurting, and the Lord finds us half dead, and He rescues us. And guess what, honey? That is not even close to keeping this passage in context. Jesus is not using this story to illustrate salvation. He is not using this story to illustrate Himself. He he is using this story to answer the question, who is my neighbor? Now, do you see what I mean about how easy it is to step out of category? And in so doing, we're misrepresenting the text. And churches and preachers and pastors do this every single day. They will take a passage that falls into this category that within context means this and they'll take it off in a direction that has no business going in because that is not even close to what the Lord was saying through this passage. In this passage, the Lord is trying to illustrate who it is that qualifies as our neighbor because after all, the Word of God commands us to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So obviously if we're commanded to love our neighbor, it's rather important that we understand who our neighbor is. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Amen. Now you cannot possibly properly understand the passage that the Lord gave us here unless you understand exactly who qualifies as our neighbor. 
Many will try and interpret the passage as though it is an illustration of salvation and the Lord himself is represented by the Samaritan in this story. This is sadly inappropriate interpretation of this specific passage. And it's not even close to the purpose or the message intended through the use of this parable. If the Lord had wanted the parable of the Good Samaritan, as it has come to be known, if he had wanted this passage to speak of him or to make some reference to salvation in the kingdom of God, he would have begun the telling of the parable with a phrase like, listen, the kingdom of heaven is like unto. See, whenever the Lord spoke a parable that had direct correlation to the kingdom of God, had direct correlation to of salvation and his role in salvation he always began by saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like unto do you follow what I'm saying so you see there, there are clear rules to follow when it comes to biblical interpretation and understanding and we've got to be careful not to be careless in our handling of the word of God now understanding the proper category and purpose of this passage, let's examine it as it was meant to be examined. The most important element in the parable of the Good Samaritan is the identification of the Samaritan as a Samaritan. Why on earth? Would the Lord use ethnicity or ethnic identity or place of origin, as it were, as a distinguishing factor? Tommy, the Lord could have said, okay, a priest came by, a Levite came by, and then a plumber came by. And the plumber helped him. Or he could have said a carpenter came by and the carpenter helped him. Or he could have said a pauper came by or a blind man came by. Or he could have used any number of examples of various types of people as it were. But instead in this parable he specifically uses the term Samaritan. You see... You don't use the word Samaritan unless you have a reason. The Samaritans had a very specific role. They had a very specific reputation in biblical society. Listen to me. Samaritans were an ethnic religious group who originated from the ancient Israelites. They were Jews. They were native to the Levant and adhere to Samaritanism, which is an Abrahamic and ethnic religion. Samaritans survived the destruction of the kingdom of Israel by uh, the Assyrians in 722 BCE. Samaritanism the religion of Samaritanism versus Judaism, even though they were originally Jews, is the Abrahamic, meaning it's born of Abraham, just like Judaism, monotheistic, just like Judaism, ethnic religion of the Samaritan people. Well, now there's another ethnic religion we're familiar with. What is it called? Judaism. So it is a religion people identify as Jewish, not only in terms of religion, but also there are those who identify as Jewish in terms of ethnicity. Am I telling the truth? Well, the same is true of Samaritan. When you identify as a Samaritan, you not only are identifying as a, uh, an ethnic Samaritan, but you then also are simultaneously identifying as one who practices Samaritism versus Judaism. Even though they both use the same ancient texts, 
They both used the Pentateuch, the five books of the Old Testament written by uh, Moses. They both used the Pentateuch. Both religions basically are very much the same. But one is specifically associated with the Samaritan people. But listen, here's how the Samaritans came about in biblical times. Samaritan, uh, the religion of the Samaritan people who alongside of the Jews originated from the ancient Israelites. Its central holy text of Samaritanism is the Samaritan Pentateuch, which Samaritans believe is the original unchanged version of the Torah that is used by the Jews. The Samaritans were a blend of all kinds of people made up of Israelites who were not exiled when the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722 B.C. Of various nationalities whom the Assyrians had resettled in the area. So, these were the only Jews who were not exiled and forced out of Israel when the Assyrians came in and took over Israel. They're the only Jews who are able to stay. But in the process of being forced to stay, they also wound up having all kinds of other ethnicities and all kinds of other people uh, kind of forced upon them. And their society became a very mixed society, okay? Became a society kind of like New York City, where you have people there from all over the world. You have Chinese and Japanese and uh, Asian people and Hispanic people from everywhere from Mexico to to Puerto Rico and you have uh, people of all different ethnicities. That's what the Samaritan people became, a very mixed, a very mingled. Well, what they began to do is they began to intermarry. And as they began to intermarry, their descendants became what you might call a half-breed. They were in effect half-Jewish by reason of ethnicity and have non-Jew. Well, this is not acceptable within the Jewish religion. Therefore, the Jews look at these people with great disdain. They don't like these people very well, the Samaritans. The Samaritans were half Jew, half Gentile. This specific race was produced after the Assyrian captivity of the northern kingdom of Israel in 721. Certain people from the nation of Israel stayed behind. These people intermarried with the Assyrians producing the Samaritans. Among the most significant differences between the Samaritans and the Jews, listen, is the site which they believe God chose for his dwelling place. While the Jews held and hold to this day that God chose Mount Zion in Jerusalem, Samaritans believe that the Lord chose Mount uh, Gerizim near Shechem. Now, interestingly enough, the Samaritans were not initially to be included with those to whom the message of Christ Jesus was to be delivered. The Lord himself purposely and specifically omitted the Samaritans. In Matthew 10, 1 through 6, and when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the publican, 
James, the son of Alphaeus, and Lebaeus, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not in the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Huh. And yet in his parable, the Lord chose to use a Samaritan. Hmm. Interestingly, it was the Lord himself who spoke the good news of his appearing to the Samaritan woman at the well. He had told his disciples not to preach, oh hallelujah, to the Samaritans. And yet he himself wound up doing so in a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. She became the first evangelist with the message of Christ to bring this good news to the Samaritan people. The Lord's mandate to his disciples, therefore, was less about exclusion than it was about timing. <laughs> See, the Lord wasn't trying to exclude the Samaritan people. He's just trying to make sure that the timing was right because he was going to do that himself. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. If the timing was to be just right, he had to prevent his disciples from prematurely going to the Samaritans with the good news of Messiah's arrival so that he himself might make that announcement personally. So in fact, the Samaritans were not excluded from receiving the message of the arrival of God's Christ, but rather they were reserved for a very special and a very distinct announcement. Hallelujah. In John chapter 4, 25 through 26, we read of the woman at the well who was a Samaritan woman. And Jesus met her at the well, and the word of God tells us, The woman saith unto him, Listen, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. You see, I told you, Judaism and Samaritanism were very much in lockstep. They very much believed the same things because their doctrine was based on the same text. One was using what you might call uh, the King James text and one was using the NIV. There were two original texts of the Torah, the Samaritans believed the text they were using was the original, and that the Jews were using basically one that had been edited, as it were. So the woman said, I know Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And in verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, <laughs> I that speak unto thee am he. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the Lord. So the Samaritans were not to be excluded, but they had been reserved for a special announcement that the Lord himself would make. Now, when the Lord spoke to his disciples after the resurrection, and he spoke of the coming of the Holy Ghost, he then spoke of the inclusion of the Samaritans in the hearing of the gospel. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, he said, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea. Now that is the territory that he initially reserved them to. Okay, Initially Jerusalem and all of Judea, meaning the Jewish uh, territories. 
He said, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Hallelujah. Why did the Lord use a Samaritan of all people in this illustration of who is our neighbor. The biggest mistake most believers make is forgetting their roots. Most Christians try to approach the notion of past sins as though they never existed. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard a Christian say, well, God has forgiven me my sins, so therefore I need to forget them too. Got news for you, children. That is wrong. While God has forgiven our sins and cleansed us of all unrighteousness, it yet behooves us to remember where we came from. For in remembering our past and our origins, we are better able to see others with compassion and with grace. Mm -hmm. The Samaritan understood. Why did the Lord use the Samaritan in this parable? Because the Samaritan understood what it was to be overlooked and ignored by the Jews. Levites and priests alike were no less likely to walk right past them, the Samaritan, without a word. Even when the situation was dire, sadly, religion can kill compassion. Mm -hmm. At least when that religion approaches God with the mentality, we alone are right and all others are not even worthy of our acknowledgement. Am I telling the truth? Yep. This reality was illustrated in the words again of the Samaritan woman to the Lord at Jacob's well. In John 4 verses 5 through 9, Then cometh he, meaning Jesus, to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well. And it was about the sixth hour. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat or to buy food. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Mm. Why did Jesus use the Samaritan in his parable? trying to illustrate who is our neighbor. Why did he use the Samaritan? The angst between the Jews and the Samaritans can also be seen in Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 53. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be, re be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. So there was angst both ways. 
Samaritans didn't care much for the Jews, and the Jews didn't care much for the Samaritans. You hear what I'm telling you now? The woman says to the Lord at the well, why are you even talking to me? I'm a woman of Samaria. You're a Jew. And Jews don't have any dealings with us. She was used to being ignored. She was used to being overlooked. She was used to uh, Jewish people just walking past her without so much as giving her a glance. And all of a sudden, here's this Jewish man asking me to give him something to drink. This is very unusual. And then Jesus is traveling, but he has to go through cities of Samaria. And so he sends his, a couple of his disciples ahead and says, Go get some accommodations there so we can spend the night. We've got a long journey ahead of us yet. And, you know, let's, let's get some food and get somewhere to stay. Make it ready so when I get there we'll have somewhere to stay. And they went, and guess what? No, those Jews weren't welcome there. They weren't interested in putting Jesus up for the night. They weren't interested in having the Lord and His servants uh, staying there in their city. Why? Now, because he's a Jew. Look where he's headed for Jerusalem. Now, if he's headed for Jerusalem, bless God, let him just pass on through and go on to Jerusalem. So there was angst that ran both ways. Although the Samaritans also served and worshipped the same God as the Jews, even using the same scriptures as the Jews, and embracing the same prophecies as the Jews. The Jews rejected them wholesale because they did not embrace the religion of the Jews, which had at its heart a geographical element. Their faith was all centered upon the temple in Jerusalem. To their religion, one could not possibly worship God in truth unless that worship was centered upon Jerusalem as the holy city and its temple as the center of all sacrifice and worship. In John chapter 4, verses 19 and 20, we're still looking at the Samaritan woman at the well talking with Jesus. She said, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say, meaning the Jews, that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So you see, that was the biggest distinction between these two religions. It was all over where God said He would set His presence. The Samaritans said, it's in this mountain over here. And the Jews said, no, it's in this mountain over here. And that's where the distinction. And people think we've got cults that run around and tell you that there shouldn't be different uh, denominations. And there shouldn't be different belief systems within Christianity. People shouldn't understand things differently than one another. Honey, it has existed since the beginning of time. There are going to be differences. People are going to have differences of opinion. They're going to differ in how they interpret Scripture and how they understand Scripture. The Word of God said, let every man be convinced in his own mind. So what's important is that you believe what you believe. That you understand it as you understand it. And as you have come to understand it. It's not about whether... Uh, you agree with them or they disagree with you. I'm not, uh, I'm not troubled by Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or Episcopalians in the world simply because they're not full gospel, spirit-filled, Pentecostal, apostolic. No, I leave them to God. It's God's business to sort this out, not mine. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to preach what I know the Word of God to say to me. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. That's my job. My job is to help people understand what I have come to understand. Now listen, concerning the Lord's parable of the Good Samaritan, if anyone could justifiably ignore a Jew in distress, it would have been a Samaritan. Mm -hmm. How do we know that the man who was beaten and robbed was a Jew? Where was he starting his journey? Notice the Lord didn't say Bethlehem. Notice the Lord didn't say any of the other cities in, in Israel. Where did he start? 
Jerusalem. Where was he going? Jericho. Aha, guess what, honey? This is a Jew. If he lives in Jerusalem, if that's where he's starting at, then he's a Jew. And yet God chose to use a Samaritan in this parable. I keep saying I'm trying to get your mind thinking a little bit. Why did the Lord use a Samaritan? Because if there was anybody in the world who would have been justified in walking past this beaten man, it would have been a Samaritan. The Samaritans and the Jews didn't much like each other. The Samaritans and the Jews didn't have much use for each other. But the Samaritan man, listen to me carefully now, lived his faith. While the Levite and the priest lived their religion. <laughs> See, the Levite and the priest, the rules say, you're not supposed to have dealings with non-Jews. You're not supposed to mingle with non-Jews. So bless God, I'm going to live my religion even though this man's life is at stake. Even though this man's been beaten and bloodied. And even though this man may very well be dying. You'll notice the word of God said that the Levite and the priest uh, looked on this man from afar and passed him on the other side of the road. If his clothes had been stripped off of him, then there was no easy way to tell this was a Jew. See, Jews, according to the law, had to wear certain articles of clothing. They had to wear fringes on the bottom of their clothes. There were certain identifiers in the way a Jewish man would dress. This man had been stripped. He was naked. There was no easy way to determine whether he was a Jew or a Gentile. There was no easy way to know. There was a way to know. <laughs> but you'd have to kind of get up close and personal to be able to look and see. Is this man circumcised or is this man not circumcised? Well, the two men who were so busy living their religion never even took the time to investigate up close and personal because you would have had to have gotten up close and personal in order to tell. No, they stood afar off. I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of people that look at us LGBT Christians today and they love to make judgments and they love to stand there and say, oh no, you can't be who you are and be a Christian. You can't be. And I guarantee you, not one of them has ever taken three minutes to stop and listen to one sermon this preacher preaches. Not a one of them has ever stopped for two minutes to have a conversation with us about how we live or how we walk or how we talk or how we believe. Not a one of them. Because their religion tells them what they're supposed to think about this situation. Am I telling the truth? Why should they bother investigating? Why should they bother getting up close and personal so they can look and see, is this person circumcised? It, could this be one of our own? I, I, I can't imagine this is one of our own, but maybe, who knows? Let me look. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Oh, they don't want to take the time, Tommy, to look up close. They, their religion is what dictates to them what the situation is. But the Samaritan man lived his faith. The same Bible that said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. The same passage that the Jews believed was also in the Samaritan text. The only difference is the Samaritan was living it. Mm -hmm. The Jew was not. The Levite was not. The priest was not. <clears throat> the man who had been beaten and robbed was most likely a Jew. We know that because he began his journey in Jerusalem. And his destination was Jericho. So why on earth would the Jewish Levite and the Jewish priest pass by a man who had been so brutally beaten and robbed? Sorry. Why would they walk past this man who had been beaten and robbed?
anything that might have identified the half-dead man as a Jew had been stripped off of him. He had been stripped of his clothing and left half-dead. The only thing that might have identified him as a Jew was his circumcision. But the Levite and the priest never got close enough to examine him physically to see whether or not he had been circumcised. Many Christians today also look upon others from a distance, not at all examining them carefully, so as to justify their prejudice and indifference to another's pain or another's distress. But when you know the pain of rejection and the sting of being ignored and bypassed as the Samaritan did, just by reason of his ethnicity. You know that you cannot walk past one who is so grievously wounded. No, that Samaritan remembered where he came from. Mm -hmm. I know who I am. I know my background. I know what my experience is based on my ethnicity. And for that reason, I can't look at somebody like this and simply ignore them. I can't look at somebody like this and simply walk past them. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? I'm going to tell you, honey, when you remember where you came from, you can find compassion. Right. When you remember where you came from, you can find mercy. Right. When you remember where where you came from you can find love when you remember where you came from you can find grace compassion is born of empathy we cannot feel and exercise compassion if we have forgotten where we come from that's right one who has known rejection who's been abandoned one who has experienced prejudice and abuse can genuinely feel empathy toward another who is experiencing these very same things. The greatest cause of lack of compassion on the part of so-called Christians is their failure to remember where they too come from. In Matthew 18, 23 through 34, my last passage today, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king, which would take account of his servants. Notice the Lord said, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto. So this is a parable that he is using to illustrate salvation. Okay? He said, which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him saying, Lord, have patience with me and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry, and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. Isn't it interesting? 
when we forget where we come from, all of a sudden we treat people very differently than we should. Mm -hmm. But oh, I'm going to tell you, one of, the, one of the worst things that could ever happen to a Christian, and I know I might have somebody out there that's going to be choking on their dentures when I say this, but one of the worst things that ever happens in the church is people are born and raised in the church. They never spend any time in the real world. They've never failed. They've never done a whole bunch of uh, horrible things. They've, they've never experienced life. And then they grow up, and boy, they just think they're the cat's meow. They just think they're so holy they can walk on water. I know I've been there. Now, I'm going to tell you, one of the best things that could happen to a lot of Christians is what we call backsliding. That's when they wind up out of church for a while, and they quit trying to serve God, and they quit trying to be a Christian, and they go out and live their life any old way they want to for a while, and then eventually, like the... Uh, the prodigal son, they come home and they come back to the church and they come back to the Lord. That's one of the best things that can ever happen to most Christians today. Because I'm going to tell you from personal experience, when you've done that, all of a sudden you've got something to remember. All of a sudden now, as you face others and you deal with others, you can remember where you come from. You can remember what God's forgiven you of. And sweetheart, don't you stand there and say, well, God forgive me of that. So I don't need to remember that. That's out of my mind. If God's forgiven me, then I don't even need to think about it. Baloney. God don't need to think about it. But you don't need to forget it. Amen. God don't think, the Lord will never remember it. The Word of God tells us. Unless mm -hmm. we don't forgive others as He's forgiven us. The Word of God. Got news for you, honey. I'm telling you, a lot of Christians have some screwed up ideology. They have some messed up theology. Forgiveness can be withdrawn. Don't fool yourself. In the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins or our debts as we forgive our debtors. The Word of God teaches that we will be forgiven if we forgive others. And I tell the truth. This servant was forgiven his debt, but when he did not forgive another who owed him far less than he owed his Lord, he was pulled right back in, and all of a sudden, his Lord held him responsible for that debt. Mm. That forgiveness was withdrawn. Mm -hmm. Christian, don't you think for one minute that God's forgiveness cannot be withdrawn. Don't you think for one minute that God cannot pull all that back into your account and make you answer for it one day? Because He can and He will. And He will do so justifiably. Because you forgot where you came from. When you saw that man beaten and bloodied on the side of the road, you just ignored him and you walked by. You couldn't find any compassion. You couldn't feel any empathy. If and when we forget what the Lord has forgiven us, we fail to retain the knowledge of our origins so as to ensure we might show compassion on another who may be in that same place or that same situation which we once knew. We cannot allow the enemy to bring us under condemnation for past sins which have now been forgiven by the Lord. But by the same token, we ought never forget where we came from as it is the memory of our past which informs our present and provides us a well of empathy from which we are able to draw out compassion, which we may then exercise toward all those who are our neighbors. The Samaritan showed compassion upon his neighbor. He did not seek to determine his ethnicity or religion, but instead he simply acted in love to save the man's life and to provide for his well-being. Knowing where you come from can really help us 
to get to that place toward which we're going. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. My message today, remember where you came from. Hallelujah.